This is the story of expeditions to two mountains, one in Chile, the other Argentina. Despite being 12 years apart, one man went on both trips. Don Willens was an icon of British climbing in the 50s and 60s, whose career peaked with the first ascent of the south face of Annapurna with Dougal Haston. In October 1962, a very strong climbing team left Britain, sailing from Liverpool for the 10,000 mile journey to distant Patagonia. Little did they realize as they passed through the Caribbean that not far away, the Cuban Missile Crisis between Kennedy and Khrushchev was reaching its climax. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. Each of these missiles, in short, is capable of striking Washington, D.C., the Panama Canal, Cape Canaveral, Mexico City, or in the Caribbean area. As a necessary military precaution, I have reinforced our base at Guantanamo, evacuated today the dependence of... Four weeks later, area. they arrived in Punta Arenas, the most southerly city in the world, and probably as safe as anywhere. It was here that in 1520, Ferdinand Magellan had discovered his famous straits separating the tip of South America from Tierra del Fuego. In the 60s, few tourists ventured so far south. The port had had its heyday 100 years ago before the opening of the Panama Canal in 1914. Now it was the center of a thriving sheep farming industry and oil had recently been discovered. At the local bar, the team met up with Juan Radic, the owner of the Estancia beneath the towers. The team was led by Barry Page, a geologist who had explored the area two years before with Derek Walker and Vic Bray. They had resolved to return with the strongest possible team. Chris Bonington had made the first British ascent of the Eiger North Wall only three months earlier with Ian Clough. Together, they'd also made the first ascent of the central pillar of Freny on Mont Blanc with Don Willens, who was widely regarded as one of the strongest climbers of his generation. The team was further strengthened by John Streetley, who was a young Cambridge climber and astounded the climbing world with a dramatic first ascent of bloody slab on Cloggy. The problems of transporting five tons of food and equipment 200 miles from Punta Arenas to the Piney Towers were helped by the Chilean army providing trucks and drivers. It was reassuring that the drivers shared their enthusiasm for the journey. But perhaps more reassuring was the fact that if the lads got into trouble, the Chileans could always send in the cavalry. After their first glimpse of the towers, the team continued to Cerro Guido, one of the many vast estancias in the area. This one managed by a British couple who welcomed the boys into their home. Here was farming on a grand scale. A hundred thousand sheep, hundreds of semi-wild horses broken in by the legendary Patagonian gauchos who spent most of their time out on the windswept pampas, only returning for wine, women, and the occasional bit of branding. Next morning, courtesy of the Chilean Air Force, the team was treated to a fantastic flight round the towers. Virtually none of these peaks had been climbed before and the potential for new routes was limitless, despite the obvious natural hazards. With the summits immersed in cloud, the pilot played a deadly game of hide and seek. Hiding somewhere in the clouds was a summit they'd come to climb. And there it was, the central tower of Pine. On the left was the north tower, on the right, the south. 
After a leisurely English breakfast and five weeks on the journey, the lads were almost there. It's worth reflecting that these climbers were amongst the first to visit this pristine area. Nowadays, you can get there within 48 hours from Europe and hundreds of travellers come here every year. This modern lightweight expedition included 700 cans of Guinness, copious supplies of McLennan's whisky, which the team had volunteered to evaluate by vigorous field testing. Despite its rickety appearance, this iron bridge was built by the British in 1928 and is still in use 80 years later. Base camp was in a sheltered spot at Estancia Seropini. The flamboyant farmer Pedro Radic was to become a real friend to the expedition, bringing regular supplies of fresh meat for the Chilean cooks to prepare and only taking beer as a payment. Eating well on expeditions is good for morale, as Don Willans noted. Derek Walker had worked wonders with the organisation and I considered this the best fed trip I'd ever been on. After dinner it was time to discuss tactics for the mountain. How much fixed ropes will be needed? How many pitons? But they were to overlook one important detail. Would the ropes be strong enough? This would be an expedition in the classic style. It would rely on fixed camps, fixed ropes, and a sprint for the summit, provided the Patagonian weather allowed. Five weeks of inactivity had taken its toll, and the team needed to get fit. In those days, there were no proper paths, and even getting to their first camp took several hours of sheer graft, causing numerous blisters and a change of dry socks. This route became known as the grind, but the rewards soon became apparent, even to Don Willans. Pretty soon we had a superb view of the towers and found traces of an Argentinian camp who had made the second ascent of the North Tower in 1960. It's hard to underestimate the sheer beauty of this area, which is now a well-protected national park of which the Chileans feel justly proud. Back in 1960, many of the mountains didn't even have a name. Perhaps not realising their future potential, the Chilean authorities had simply called them Torres Inominatus, towers with no names. Entering the next valley were two such mighty peaks. On their expedition two years earlier, Barry Page and Derek Walker, being British, renamed them the Fortress and the Shield. The name stuck. Over the next few days, they established this camp behind the towers. By now the weather was getting colder and as they huddled in the tents they had a hint of Patagonia's famous winds. Oblivious to this, Chris Bonington immersed himself in a book which with the benefit of hindsight had a rather unfortunate title. Meanwhile, Don Willans waited patiently for someone to bring him his cup of tea. The next stage was to set up camp within striking distance of the col between the north and central towers, where the real climbing would begin. Snow slopes and steep slabs took them to a site where a platform would need to be levelled amongst the boulders. Here a small tent was erected and stocked with food. A budding journalist takes over the story. 
climbed or seen some of the most spectacular peaks in the world, but I've never seen one to match this central tower for sheer perfection of line for unrelenting steepness. It's not as high as a Himalayan peak, but it is steeper on all sides. There seems to be no break, no weakness in its defence. If the technical difficulty of the rock was our only problem, we should have our hands full. We have an even more dangerous enemy. It's the wind. We put a small camp on the moraine between the towers and began to fix ropes up to the col between the north and the south towers, which we called the notch. On December the 4th, Don Willans and Barry Page reached the notch. This is the start of the real difficulties, where the wall rears up sheer for 8,000 feet before relenting slightly for the last few hundred. They saw cracks in the smooth surface of the granite and that, therefore, there is definitely a route up the towers. It seems as if a creative sub-editor got confused between what looks like 800 feet and 8,000 feet. It couldn't be that high, Chris. No, it couldn't. No, that's yeah. fair. That's fair. For a minute today, John Streetley and I swung helplessly over a 4,000 foot drop on the central tower of these remote mountains. Our lives depended on a steel spike driven into a crack in the smooth rock. Already a spike on which Streetley was depending had come out. God, I'm sure I didn't write any of that stuff. The sub-editor strikes again. Um, anyway, let's go on. John and I had just passed Don Willans and Ian Clough, my partner on Eiger North Face. They'd done a marvellous job. Don had led up a practically holeless slab of smooth granite. This is the sort of things he excels at. With a cigarette in his mouth, balancing on minute rugosities, his fingers delicately feeling the rock, he moved steadily up the face. This was climbing of the very highest order. Viewed from so near at hand, the central tower was a rock climber's dream. 1,600 feet of magnificent granite containing every conceivable rock feature and offering unlimited challenges to the climber. Don and Ian had pushed the route up 400 feet. It's known as siege tactics. Climb all day, fix the rope and scurry back to camp to recover. Yes, that's how we used to have Sal. Rope across your back and wrapped around your arms. It perhaps explains why duvets in the 1960s always seem short of feathers. The tower was going to need a lot of equipment and Don and Ian had to return for more. But by the time they reached their camp, the weather had turned for the worse. The marine camp was abandoned and the team retreated to the woods to take stock of the situation. But even at this much lower altitude, there was heavy snow right in the midst of what the locals quaintly call the Patagonian summer. It was, however, an excellent opportunity for the lads to try their new matching full-length cagoules. And didn't they look smart? Fortunately, many of the styles of the sixes were later dropped. Willens remained unimpressed. There's nothing for it, lads, but to go down to base camp. You never know, we might have visitors. Company arrived in the shape of an expedition from the Italian Alpine Club. They too had come to climb the central tower. The best equipped expedition mountaineering has ever known arrived yesterday in Punta Arenas, the continent's southernmost city, to challenge the young British team attempting the Towers of Paine. With all costs underwritten by the President of Italy, the climbers from the Monza section of the Italian Alpine Club, the Brits pointed out that they were already established and the ideal solution would be for the Italians to do the first ascent of the South Tower. The Italians implied that we hadn't got permission to climb the central tower. I pointed out in no uncertain terms that we were on the central tower and permission or not, if they wanted to move us off it, then it would have to be by force. 
It appeared that they'd even promised the Pope that they would climb the central tower and nothing else would do. It was news to me that the Pope was interested in climbing. I thought he was high enough up already. It seemed though they were in radio contact with him. Anyway, Derek, acting as diplomat, suggested it was all right with us if they attempted the central tower, as long as they chose a different route to ours. The Italians accepted this and gave us assurances that on no account would they trespass on our line. Christmas was something the Chileans take very seriously. In the absence of turkeys and more sheep than you can count, the traditional feast is asado, barbecued lamb. Here, any similarity with the British recipe ends. Asado is cooked in chimichurri sauce, which is a strong mixture of vinegar, garlic, onions, red chili peppers, and if you can possibly spare it, red wine. I've got a morbid fear of dehydration. The traditional Patagonian method of getting over a hangover requires an instant bath in the nearest ice-cold glacial lake. Over the festive period, the lads had not been entirely idle. In fact, a novel idea had emerged that would not only follow them back to Britain, but would revolutionise future Himalayan climbing. During their forced layoff, they'd been working on the problem of protecting their high camp from the wind, and came up with the idea of a solidly built hut, large enough to provide comfort and protection, but small enough to be transported. Using timber from a nearby estancia and sheets of tarpaulin, they constructed what turned out to be the ideal answer to Patagonia's furious winds. It became known as the Willens Box. <coughs> Chris continues the story. Well, Don and I had gone up waiting for the good weather, and I think it was the morning after we'd moved up there to the, the box. It was absolutely a perfect night that night, and so we knew that it was on the next day. And so the next morning we set out and went up and, of course, went past the, the top camp of the Italians, which had been completely wiped out, and they'd retreated. And then on up the fixed ropes that we'd fixed in the last few days before the bad weather had come in and before the Italians had arrived until we came to the actual slab itself. And that was the first time I'd been that high. We swarmed up the fixed ropes to a feature we'd named the Big Slab, which was the highest point we'd reached. Don went up first. I was belaying him, and I remember just seeing him kind of going up the fixed rope, hand over hand as a sizable rope. Don was climbing by one of the ropes we had fixed up a hundred foot sheer slab. Below him was a 2,000 foot drop. What we did not know was that the rope had been frayed to snapping point by the fearful winds that tear away at the face of the tower. Here death came very near. I was leading Chris up the big slab when I had a most air-raising experience. All in up on a rope, which Ian and I had left dangling down the slab. I was amazed to feel it snap in my hand. Expecting to fall, it took me some seconds to realise I was in fact sticking to the rock with pure friction. Carefully, I eased my right hand across to where the broken end of the rope dangled. Somehow, I managed to tie the two ends together and with extreme caution, 
continued to move upwards. If he had gone, we would probably both have gone together. The tension of the whole thing was so great. I mean, when I came up as well, and I mean, he was cool as he ever was. You know, we hardly commented on it. As I was climbing, I heard shouts from below. Derek and Ian were pointing and yelling that there were three Italians on the Electron ladder. Don't worry. If that wedge comes out, there'll be three less of the Pope's mates. What the hell do they think they're going to do if they do catch up with us? Climb all over us? No bloody chance. This is the Voir Britannia. And then Don led through and the pitch that he led was another beautiful pitch and he climbed it very, very fast. And we continued on up until we got the shoulder. And of course, as you pull over the shoulder, by this time it was late afternoon, we could see the way up to the top was fairly easy. Chris and I pressed on, as only a few hundred feet of the central tower now remained. Eventually, across a gap, I saw the true summit only a hundred feet away. I rapidly climbed up the rocks and reached the top. Chris joined me and we grinned broadly at each other. Cupping our hands to our mouths, we shouted in unison, Big Ned is dead. Big Ned is dead, and of course that was our name for the central town. It had had, it had come to have an almost human, ogre-like kind of presence. And then having a terrific superstitious kind of, gosh, is that a good thing to say? It was an absolutely fantastic still evening, and of course the view of the fortress, the Piney Grande in the, the distance. It was incredible. And I, there was a kind of state of almost euphoria. And I think as well, I think Don and I had had our differences and there was a moment of real unity at that moment, which, which was very good. The next morning, the moment the sun was up on us, we. We managed to get ourselves started and started abseiling down. Met our friends, the Italians, halfway down. I think they'd had an uncomfortable bivouac as well. I couldn't care less about how many Italians used our ropes now. They could bring the whole of Rome up if they wanted. And there was this pedestal just above the niche. And our f abseil ropes went about halfway down again, but didn't quite reach the actual notch itself. And of course, there was Derek and the guys there. They had food for us, they had drink, they even had beer for us. The rope wasn't quite there, but there was a little ledge at the bottom. One of the sisal ropes, one of the ropes that had broke with Don, that was just hanging down there. And I think we were very, very tired, we were hungry, we were over elated, and we just couldn't be bothered to pull the abseil rope all the way down and then refix it just for that 12 feet. Don went down first and got down perfectly all right. And then I followed. And I'd say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I was that much bigger than Don. Don was very lean in those days. And I was that much heavier. I got about halfway down and then suddenly it just broke. Ah! Oh, God, well, that brings back memories. That happened 44 years ago. I'd just fallen something like 15 feet, landed on the slab, rolled down the slab, and I knew there was a thousand foot drop just below me. And I scrabbled and I stopped just at the edge of the drop. I then realized I'd broken my ankle into the bargain. It was a very, very near escape. There were three things left to do. Get an injured Chris Bonington down the mountain and back to base clear their equipment off the mountain, and if time allowed, do some more climbing. It all went to make a very successful expedition even better. 
Don even suggested that the Italians were welcome to use their hotel and even muttered something about learning Italian. After successfully testing all the bottles of whiskey and wine, all that was left were two bottles of French champagne. But for Don Willens, as far as drink is concerned, he held no prejudices. 